Hey everybody, welcome to JPD Weekly. We have uh, some important things to talk about today. If you've been following the news at all, there have been a lot more uh, recent developments, recent stories, ma mainly headlines, and a lot of it is sensationalized, but around the whole topic of aliens, UFOs, government disclosure, all that kind of stuff. And uh, of course, a lot of that is sensationalized, but it does bring up the question for Christians, how do aliens play into the whole, you know, biblical Christian worldview type of thing? Is it, Would the existence of extraterrestrials actually negate something in Christianity? Now, I know for me, hands down, the biggest question that I ever had as a child was, uh, are aliens real. I, I loved science fiction. In fact, I still do. Uh, I also loved the Bible, and again, I still do. But I didn't know if the two were compatible. So I was raised in a Baptist family who, who mostly didn't think that uh, those kinds of questions were really you know, too important. A lot of it would get brushed off. And that, that's not a dig on anybody, of course. Everybody has his or her own interests and priorities. But when, when I would ask someone in, in my family or the pastor of our church uh, or friends, you know, whatever about aliens, the answer was usually some variation of, uh, you know, oh, Josh, they're, they're just demons. Don't you know that? That's all it is. It's just demons. Uh, as if that, that was, it was, it was like a blanket statement to just like, okay, that handles that question. Now you shouldn't have any more questions about it. Right. Uh, so that was basically that, you know, they're demons. That's all you need to know. That's all we need to know. Uh, but as, as a child, um, even as a teenager and a, a young adult, I craved more information. You know, if, if it was true that aliens are demons, why? Where, where do we get that from? And the Bible is basically seemingly silent on the issue, though there have been some attempts throughout history to uh, read one position or another into the text. But as we're going to see throughout this video and probably on into another video uh, for if you're watching this on YouTube for next week, if you're watching this on Daily Renegade, you can get access to all of it now through early access uh, for our members. But, but as we'll see... Um, that, that's what a lot of people try to do. They, they read their own opinions into the text. So how can the demonic theory be supported using the text of the Bible? You know, I wondered about these questions for the rest of my uh, young life. And as a teenager, especially after the age of 18, I began to accept the possibility of life on other planets. You know, a, bi a big influence on me at the time was New Age theology. You know, I was young. New Age was exciting. New Age allowed, allowed me to believe in aliens. So it seemed like a good fit at the time. It wasn't, obviously, but reasons for that kind of go a bit outside the scope of the topic of this video. But I have uh, I have a whole other book on the topic, Second Coming of the New Age, and many videos. Uh, New Age just about ruined my life. And I thank God and praise Jesus uh, that I got out of it when I did. But, uh, but, but aside from all that, by the time that I was in my mid-20s, I was pretty much convinced that aliens were real. I, I didn't believe they were demonic, but I did believe that they were created by God in some way. I couldn't justify my views with uh, biblical texts, and I certainly had many unanswered questions, as many people do today, but that didn't matter to me as much at the time. So after I had a couple of years with uh, these groundless beliefs that I had, and I'm not, I'm not saying that there aren't grounds for believing these things. I, I, just, I personally didn't know of any at the time. I, I, I basically had these beliefs just because I wanted them, just because they were exciting. I didn't have a real reason for, for believing these things. But I began to crave more information. You know, if, if aliens were real, then why didn't the Bible talk about them? Why would God create something and not tell us about it? Especially since people seem to have horrific visitations and abduction experiences. Why, why would God keep all that a secret? That didn't make any sense to me. And the, the holes in my logic were starting to grow too big to ignore. So I did the only sensible thing I could think of at the time. I decided to pray and ask God about it. And of course, I did not get an answer right away. Uh, in fact, even today, I'm not sure that I have the full answer. I, I've done a lot of work in this area. Uh, actually, a lot of the information we're going to be talking about in this video and, and probably the next video comes from a book that uh, Derek Gilbert and I uh, co-authored together a few years ago. Uh, se uh, um, what is it? Uh, the day the earth stands still. I almost said second coming in the new age again. Uh, 
uh, The Day the Earth Stands Still. And that book was really written before its time. It's more relevant, to, relevant today than it was when we first wrote it. Um, I mean, there are even predictions in that book that, uh, had, that, that proved to come true. What one major prediction is um, Derek and I were able to predict that there would be something big happening with uh, UFO disclosure. We predicted it a couple of months in advance. Um, actually, we just now released a new film at dailyrenegade.com. It's called What Comes Next. It's based on me and Derek's book, and it's based on that prediction. Uh, it goes through the prediction and goes through what we can expect in our near future as well. I mean, if we were right about that, could we be right about other things? And it's not a mystical prophetic gift. There's actually a formula that you can follow having to do with major events in Israel uh, and, and major events with UFO stuff. You, those actually tend to correlate. This is a truly historic moment. It will be known as the Abraham Accord. Ever since the news broke of the peace agreement between Israel and the United Arab Emirates, many Christians have been wondering what it all means. Is it significant? Is it momentous and historic? Or could it even be prophetic? Most importantly, after this, what comes next? Everybody said this would be impossible. I, we have that movie available right now at dailyrenegade.com. Right now, it is only available to paying members. So you have to have a monthly membership or a yearly membership, and you get the film for free. Uh, you know, your, your, your membership is enough. You don't have to pay extra for the film. And at some point in the future, we will make it available on rental sites, but uh, we just got denied from Amazon. So there's, there's something in this movie that somebody must find threatening. I, I have Silent Cry, The Darker Side of Trafficking, which is all about child sex trafficking and the Satanism around it. That was accepted through Amazon, but for some reason this film wasn't. Um, so it's called What Comes Next. It's all about the Abraham Accords, uh, how things are changing from the Trump presidency to the Biden presidency in terms of Israel, uh, the Middle East geopolitics, and uh, centered around UFOs and, and disclosure stuff. Uh, and we have uh, myself, um, Derek, Gilbert, Derek Gilbert is obviously in it, Lieutenant Colonel Robert McGinnis, he's our Pentagon insider, and he's got some interesting things to say about the Pentagon's involvement in UFOs. Uh, uh, Pastor Steve Ciccolani, most of you are probably familiar with him, he's, he is in it. Uh, and we uh, and, and there's others, and we have um, uh, Zachary Lautitas as the narrator. Uh, some of you might be familiar with him from some movies. He was in that show Prison Break, uh, if you remember that show. Uh, but he he was kind enough to provide the voiceover for the film, and we're actually going to get him on uh, the show at some point for an interview because he's been doing some interesting work in this area too. He's also a Christian. Everybody in the film, uh, they're all Christians. Uh, my wife is in it, so it's it's a really great cast and uh it's, it's a great film but it goes into all this and especially what we can expect in the near future and so i, I think that it's important that you check that out i don't know when we're going to be able to get it available to rent for the general public because again amazon denied it i did not expect that it should have already been on amazon but they said no and did not give us a reason why so we're going to try to get it maybe on uh youtube or vimeo rental but again we have to make it rental for these third-party platforms because they have the ability to just delete things whenever they want. And uh, we want to be able to maintain access to our own content. So the best way, the, really right now, the only way to watch it is to go to dailyrenegade.com, get a membership. It's not available for just people who have a trial. Uh, it's got to be a, pay, a paid membership. Get, get a membership uh, monthly or yearly. Uh, if you can afford to do it, the yearly is the better deal because you actually, if you do the math, you end up doing getting two months for free that way. Uh, but go ahead and get that, and then you'll have access to the full film, and you can watch it at your leisure through the website. So uh, dailyrenegade.com, make sure you do that. But I, I've been doing a lot of work in this area for a long time, and I, I still don't know if I have the full answer. I have friends on all sides of the aisle. Uh, my good friend 
friend Timothy Alberino, I did a long uh, five-part series on his new book, Birthright, and he, he takes the stance that these are not demons, these are actual alien extraterrestrial entities. Uh, and he, he puts forth some compelling arguments why he believes that. So, um, you know, I, I, I like getting all sides of the story, and I don't know yet exactly where I fall, but I will say I do believe that Christianity can accommodate a genuine extraterrestrial reality. And I, I want to talk about that because there are pieces of the answer out there that I was not aware of at the time. And the more that I discovered these pieces, the more they seemed to bring the total picture into focus. So my, my piece of the puzzle was the Genesis 6 Nephilim interpretation of alien UFO phenomena. That was my first piece. And because that interpretation that has been vastly covered by other authors and researchers, you know, far more eloquent than me. Uh, I'm not going to cover that as much in this video, except I will say that it is a very legitimate interpretation um, and one that I held onto for years and in many ways I still do. I still think there's a lot of possible scenarios on how things could play out there. Uh, I do suggest that if the reader is not familiar uh, with the topic of the Nephilim, that you pick up a copy of The Unseen Realm by Dr. Michael S. Heiser. Uh, I believe it to be the best writing on the topic, although Genesis 6 is only one aspect of the book. For information about how it might relate to the modern UFO phenomenon, uh, there are th th there's a lot of books and DVDs on the topic, way more to list. However, most of those you can get through Defender Publishing. Um, and so you, you, can, you can check that out. You can check out me and Derek's book, The Day the Earth Stands Still. Again, it's more relevant today than it was when we first wrote it, and especially since this is now coming up in the news again. Now, after years uh, with the Genesis 6 Nephilim interpretation, I began to get the feeling that there was more to that story. So certain issues were still up in the air. I still had a lot of questions. As with any issue, I wanted to understand the other viewpoints in order to weigh them against my own. And I really wanted to know, given the amount of current information, yet in a completely broad sense, you know, not considering specific races such as like greys, reptilians, and Nordics and all that for the moment, but just in a general sense, I wanted to know if evangelical Christian Christianity could accommodate an undeniable extraterrestrial reality. Maintaining um, the demonic interpretation, uh, as I as I just stated, you know the, the fact that aliens are demons, and uh, again that is a very broad brush that really needs to be understood uh, more. But with with that. Um, I, I hold to what is generally referred to as the demonic interpretation, but again, I hold to it loosely, and I also am very aware that it doesn't answer everything. Uh, but that's that's still kind of currently where where I'm at with it, although, again, I'm still searching. Now, what, what this means in brief terms is that, you know, I, I, I fully recognize and accept that the typical races of entities commonly referred to as aliens, so reptilians, greys, nordics, mantids, are most likely demonic beings and or fallen angels. And, uh... I, I, we outline all the, the reasons for that. We outline it in detail in The Day the Earth Stands Still. Just look up Day the Earth Stands Still, Derek Gilbert, Josh Peck, you'll find it. Uh, but we, we lay it all out in a way that I don't think has ever been done. Uh, a lot of times the demonic interpretation is dealt with in broad strokes, and we didn't want to do that. We wanted to, give, we wanted to lay out a case, and so we did. Uh, so I, I believe that that's the likeliest interpretation um, of, of current alien abductions, and it's due to the anti-Christian and anti-biblical na nature of the messages, the teachings, and philosophies given to abductees from these entities. To me, if they were aliens, just regular extraterrestrials, I don't know why they would care so much about uh, denying the deity of Jesus. That seems strange to me. But, uh, but the reason that I wanted to make that clear in the beginning here uh, perhaps more than ever before, you know, is that it, it may prove challenging to some Christians if the purpose of this video is not properly understood. So this video isn't done in order to state that the beings commonly witnessed in alien abduction pheno phenomena are in fact aliens. Uh, I, I don't believe that to be true. However, again, in that series I did with Tim Alberino, Tim brought up some uh, very interesting things that I don't know how to answer, and, and I do agree with him. Aliens do not act like demons. When you, when you read about what demonic manifestations look like in the Bible, that does not match with aliens, like alien abduction. So I, I don't know. 
I don't know how to parse that, but I, I do know that there are more spiritual entities than only demons. Um, so there, there could be something there. Like, for example, I don't think a fallen angel would act the same as a demon. Uh, but anyway, but that the, the topic is of this video is to, to kind of answer this broader question. Wherever you fall in line on this on this idea about aliens, um, I, I want to divorce the 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 topic of extraterrestrials. I want to divorce that from the UFO and alien abduction phenomena altogether for this video. So basically, what we're going to be looking at is the question from a purely theological position. Uh, can extraterrestrials exist within a biblical framework? We're not talking about alien abductions. We're not talking about UFOs. Uh, well, I mean, we'll mention it, but that, that's not going to play a part. We're, we're talking about could, could life exist out there? Not are they interacting with us. Um, so for the moment, we're going to be setting aside any commonly reported non-human entity. So this video could uh, easily be misconstru misconstrued if, it's, if that's not established right off the bat. This is not apologetics for commonly reported non-human entities to be understood as aliens from another planet. I don't personally endorse that view, though I, I do think there's a possibility there. But th this is more to just ask the question, what does the Bible have to say about the possibility of life on other planets? Um, so anyone who has done a substantial study of official disclosure has come across the religious aspect to this question. How would religious institutions react to either an official disclosure event or a genuine extraterrestrial presence as a whole? We got a little bit of taste of that a couple of years ago when the Pentagon came out with, um, uh, well, some disclosure that they were actually studying the UFO phenomenon and had, had some evidence towards it, which was really strange. And what we found out was the Christian church did not panic. And I think that is actually going to be emboldening the government to come out with more things. Uh, and I, I lay out reasons for that in The Day the Earth Stands Still. But it has been hypothesized that that this was the major reason why our government seemed to be hiding information from us about UFOs. Uh, fear of widespread panic and hysteria, especially among religious groups. I think in the soft disclosure that we got in 2018, I think that they were, they were proven wrong on that. Nobody freaked out. Actually, a lot of people didn't really seem to care much. Uh, so I think, again, that's going to embolden them. But, but there have been several attempts to gauge what the reaction would be among religious Americans. The earliest formal effort was in the Alexander UFO Religious Crisis Study in 1994. And uh, it's it's uh, off works for for short. It, it's an anagram. They just call it that. Off works. So this survey was interesting for a couple different reasons. It focused on a sample of Protestant ministers, Roman Catholic priests, and Jewish rabbis, and it asked questions related to possible government disclosure of UFOs and uh, alien contact information. And also, it was directed by Victoria Alexander, wife of Army Colonel Dr. John Alexander, a veteran of the U.S. Army Intelligence and Security Command and uh, Los Alamos National Laboratory's non-lethal weapons program, as well as a member of the Intergovernmental Advanced Theoretical Physics Working Group. Now, the purpose of the survey was to find an answer to a seemingly simple but extremely important question. Would disclosure of U.S. government contacts with aliens really precipitate a religious crisis that would threaten continuity of government and even our civilization? So to find an answer, uh, they, there was a mail survey of Protestant, Catholic, and Jewish clergy, and that was conducted in order to discover their informed opinions. Uh, 1,000 copies of the survey were mailed to randomly selected religious bodies in the United States, and the results of the survey were based on a 23% return, so 230 of the 1,000 surveys. Not a lot. <laughs> so for the survey, the U.S. was divided into five regions. Uh, 563 surveys were sent to Protestant churches, 396 to Roman Catholic churches, and only 41 to Jewish synagogues. And among the questions in the survey, one asked for the approximate size of their congregation. 81 uh, Protestant respondents answered the, quote, approximate size of congregation line, uh, end quote, uh, totaling to 35,824 families. Uh, 45 Roman Catholic respondents answered, totaling 56,208 families. And then six Jewish respondents answered, totaling 1,445 families. So altogether, this totals uh, 132 congregations and 93,477 families. So roughly 130 congregations, roughly 100,000 
families. Now, based on a U.S. population of 280 million at the time, well, actually, I don't know if that number is correct anymore. Let's say right around 300 million at, at this time. Uh, Protestants represent 28% of the population, 54% of uh, church membership as well are Protestant. Catholics represent 20% of the population and 38.6% of church membership. And then lastly, uh, Jews represent 2% of the population and 4% of church membership. So the fourth highest religious body, Eastern churches, represented 1% of the population and 2% of church membership. So these four religious groups represented 51% of the U.S. population. Less than 25% of the surveys were returned, and also there was uh, no questions to determine how theologically conservative, meaning uh, do they take the Bible as the inspired word of God? There was no questions uh, for the individual minister, priest, or rabbi who answered the survey. So we have no idea. And logically, the more conservative the respondent, the more likely he or she is to be troubled by some of the questions in the survey. So, for example, some of the questions were, uh, do you think genetic similarities between mankind and an advanced extraterrestrial civilization would challenge the basic religious concepts of man's relative position in the universe? Uh, or if an advanced extraterrestrial civilization had religious beliefs fundamentally different from ours, would it endanger organized religions in the country? Uh, another question was, if an, if an advanced extraterrestrial civilization proclaimed responsibility for producing human life, would it cause a religious crisis? So questions like that may have been the reason for such a low percentage of return. Um, some, possibly uh, even most, based on the 23% return, uh, may have either been troubled by the questions or thought them to be just ridiculous. They may have throw, uh, chosen to throw the survey in the garbage rather than consider the question seriously and theologically. So as popular as that survey became in the UFO community, the math and percentage speak to its legitimacy. If we were generously to assume a family is four people on average, two adults, two kids, then only 373, 374,000 people in the U.S. were covered. Uh, and so, you know, you take the families, the number of families, the 93,000, you multiply that by four to get that number. So given that, only about half of the respondents disclosed their congregation side. So we can double that figure to liberal, li very liberally estimate a total of 700,000, 750,000 people. So that means by the survey's own calculations and sources that at most only t only 0.27 percent uh, of the U.S. population was accounted for in that survey, but that survey blew up. I mean, it was it was extremely popular in the UFO community. But th again, that only counts for one in 374 people in the U.S. So that, that's roughly the equivalent of taking two random students out of an, an average American high school and expecting only their views to represent the views of the rest of the students in the high school. So the survey does not cover what is needed to fairly assess how religious people would react to a genuine extraterrestrial reality. So one might wonder how we got here. How did evangelical Christianity and theological conservatism get to the point at which it is generally opposed to the idea of life on other worlds? So the history of that question, it's, it's deep. It could fill an entire book on its own. Um, but surprisingly, it hasn't always been this way. In fact, it wasn't even that long ago that a belief in the possibility of extraterrestrial life was common. It was uh, commonly accepted among Christians and other religious circles. So what changed? The major opponents to the idea of life on other worlds in ancient times were Plato and Aristotle. Both philosophers held to a geocentric cosmology, so the view stating that the sun and everything in the heavens revolves around the earth. And from this, Aristotle and Plato asserted that all matter was contained in this world, thereby leaving no room for other worlds. And the unchangeability of the heavens was cited as proof of that. So most early Christian authors generally opposed the idea of extraterrestrial life because they tended to favor Platonic and Aristotelian philosophical views rather than the materialistic philosophy of uh, atomists at the time. Uh, but over time, questions arose. You know, if God was all-powerful, why was he only able to create one world? And also, if only one world existed, how could God possibly be truly infinite and uh, omnipotent? So the theologian Thomas Aquinas 
uh, from 1225 to 1274, he expressed his ideas about how to solve this problem. Uh, he said that God has the power to create infinite worlds, but that all the matter in the universe had to be used to construct Earth. So things began to turn around in 1277 when Etienne Tempier, a bishop of Paris, issued a condemnation of doctrines that seemed to set limits on God's omnipotence under the authority of the Pope. So one of the uh, propositions condemned was uh, called the first cause uh, cannot make many worlds. That, that was what, what it literally says. So th this did not mean that the church began teaching about life on other planets or what was called plurality of worlds at the time. The physics of Aristotle, which were, they're still popular until about the 16th century, uh, taught that if any other world did exist, they would have to gravitate to the center of the universe where Earth is believed to be located. So rather than the extreme of uh, teaching plurality of worlds, it merely became wrong to suggest that God could not create many worlds if he wanted. Now in 1410, some more progress was made. The Jewish philosopher, uh, Crickus uh, wrote, quote, everything said in negation to the possibility of many worlds is vanity and a striving after wind. Yet we are unable by means of mere speculation to ascertain the true nature of what is outside this world. Our sages, peace beyond them, have seen fit to warn against searching and inquiring into what is above and what is below, what is before and what is behind, end quote. So while Krakus was not, uh, well, 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 while he was able to entertain the possibility, he still restrained the idea with a warning against pursuing it much farther. So the openness to, uh, the openness that the religion world was beginning to see led to the introduction of what Christian philosophers, excuse me, would call the principle of plentitude, and that was during the Renaissance. So this was a philosophical slash theological idea, not necessarily a biblical one. And it said that an omnipotent creator like the God of the Bible must, of necessity, bring to be everything possible to fully honor his own goodness and power. So Christian theology went from seeing other worlds as possible to arguing that they might even be required. I, I personally don't hold that view, but that, that's just kind of how this view developed. The, the principle of plenitude caused this line of thinking to take another leap forward in 1440 when Cardinal Nicholas of Cusa, uh, and that's, uh, yeah, Bishop of Brixen and Christian philosopher wrote of uh, learned ignorance. So in that book, he stated, quote, rather than think so many stars and parts of the heavens are inhabited and that this earth of ours is alone peopled, we will suppose that in every region there are inhabitants differing in nature by rank and all owing their origin to God, end quote. So Nicholas of Cusa was the first prominent Latin Christian scholar to embrace the idea of extraterrestrials. Later, uh, during the Reformation, the principle of plenitude faced some op opposition, uh, especially from Lutheran uh, reformer Philip uh, Me Melanchon. Uh, and in 1550, he warned that C Copernic Copernican cosmology would lead to a dangerous idea stating that Christ's incarnation and redemption could have occurred on, a, on, on another planet. Now, despite this belief in extraterrestrials among Christians and Christian theologians continued to ride in, uh, rise in popularity during the Enlightenment. And near the end of the 18th century, the generally accepted view inside and outside the church was that the universe was filled with intelligent life. In fact, in light of the principle of plenitude, uh, many Christians believed that the possibility of life elsewhere in the universe actually enhanced an individual's religious perspective. Uh, but the acceptance of the possibility or even the, the probability, according to most at the time, of extraterrestrial life was un, uh, undermined by one of the Enlightenment's major figures, Thomas Paine, in 1793. He argued that as astronom uh, astronomical science made it impossible for any thinking person to accept the general Christian notions of a divine incarnation and redeemer. Uh, and he wrote that in his book, Age of Reason. So through his history of confronting Christianity's belief in extraterrestrial life, Paine actually became a deist. In his own words, quote, from whence could arise the strange conceit that the Almighty should come to die in our world because they say one man and one woman had eaten an apple? And on the other hand, are we to suppose that every world in the boundless creation had an Eve, an apple, a serpent, and a redeemer? The Son of God would have nothing else to do than travel from world to world in an endless succession of death with scarcely a momentary interval of life. 
End quote. Now, many Christian authors in the period after Paine responded to his arguments. So among the most uh, successful were Timothy Dwight and Thomas Chalmers. And uh, both of them were conservative in terms of their theology. Dwight was the president of Yale University from 1795 until his death in 1817. Chalmers was the most prominent uh, Scottish religious figure of his day. He's quoted as saying, quote, For anything we can know by reason, the plan of redemption may have its influence and its bearings on those creatures of God who people, uh, uh, who, who, who people, who people other regions, like populate other regions. So the belief in, uh, end quote, so the belief in the possibility of extraterrestrial life continued through the late 19th and 20th centuries in the church, but it soon turned into the threat that many Christians see it as today. Uh, with the advent of Darwinism, scientists began to be viewed as antagonistic by Christian, and many of them were, uh, by Christians who accepted the Bible's claim of, of, of a divine creator. The church became increasingly hostile to the idea of intelligent life on other planets. Um, once Darwinists concluded that the discovery of extraterrestrial life would add support for naturalistic evolution against the idea of a creator. So this led to where we are today. Throughout much of history, the church supported the idea of extraterrestrial life. And, of course, intelligent life on other planets brought up important theological issues, such as relating to the incarnation and redemption. But these questions were not viewed as threats to the faith. So two main issues drove the church away from the E.T. question altogether, neither of which actually came from the Bible itself. The first was uh, that certain threatening, yet not theologically sound, problems were invented by people like Paine. Uh, so the, the thought that Jesus would have to die on every planet, that, that, that was just kind of invented as a problem. It's not really a problem. Uh, second was the unnecessary link of random and natural evolutionary theory to the extraterrestrial life question. Um, if evolution is not proof of life here on Earth, then why would evolution have to be proof of life if it's found on another planet? That's all that Christians would have to think about it. So uh, the, 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 first, the first thing, you know, the first idea of, of Jesus dying on other planets, that made Christians wonder if the question of extraterrestrial life was a legitimate problem. And then the second, the one, the link to evolution, caused Christians to feel like they had to distance themselves from the idea of extraterrestrial life so as to not accept the naturalistic and evolutionary explanation of life both on Earth and possibly on other planets. So the supposed threat of evolution today that we see, you know, we're still dealing with some of those same problems within the church. So it's generally accepted by the world standards that intelligent alien life would either prove or at least be strong evidence uh, for the theories of naturalistic evolution and or panspermia, which is the idea that uh, state, it, it's an idea that states life on Earth came from outer space, basically. But that problem is pretty irrelevant. Uh, many theologically conservative Christians embrace the theory of evolution. I personally don't, but I'm not going to call somebody's uh, salvation into question over it. I do believe that Christians who accept evolution are in error, but I still consider them my brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, but they see evolution as a process started by God rather than by some accident or a completely natural event. So these, these Christians are usually known as theistic evolutionists or intelligent design theorists. So for them, the concern isn't evolution as a whole. The concern is specifically naturalistic, purposeless, and undirected evolution. That's what they would take issue with. If extraterrestrial life forms were discovered, those in that category would assume that God started the same evolutionary process on other planets as they recognize here on Earth, and extraterrestrial life would be the result. Now, uh, those who reject evolution as a process of creation, uh, such as myself, could, by default, hold the position that God created alien life forms just as he created life on Earth. The evolution angle really is no threat to Christianity, regardless of whether one believes in evolution or not. Even if evolution were true, it still does not explain the origin of matter in the universe. Uh, how life evolves and how life originates in the first place are two totally separate qu questions. 
the discovery of an advanced extraterrestrial civilization would not answer the question of origin. So even if E.T. claimed to be the origin of humanity, the question could just be turned around. Well, then who created you, alien? <laughs> you know, of, of course, one does not have to believe in evolution in order to accept the possibility of uh, extraterrestrial life. But it is good to understand why some choose to embrace evolution while still accepting the Christian faith. As early as the 4th and 5th centuries, biblical scholars and theologians were already, already noticing peculiar phrasing in the creation account. Genesis 1, 24 states, And God said, let the earth bring forth every living creature. Let the earth bring forth every living creature. So Gregory of Nyssa uh, understood this as meaning there was a type of potency in pre-existing material that can be activated only by the creator when he sees fit to do so. Uh, Augustine thought along similar lines when he stated that the creator, quote, implanted seeds or potencies of each separate kind of organism in the created universe from the first moment of its existence. He made all things together, disposing them in an order based not on intervals of time, but on causal connections. There was invisibly present all that would later develop, end quote. I personally disagree with that, but again, Christians could hold that view. Now, this brings us back to one of the survey questions from earlier uh, in this video. Would it be troublesome to a Christian if extraterrestrial life was discovered to have a genetic relationship to human beings? If we accept that God created everything, it actually would be reasonable to expect a genetic relationship between life on other planets and life on Earth. Because there are genetic relationships between life forms on Earth, such as those between primates and humans. That doesn't mean one comes from another, it just means that we have the same creator. Now, um, so I, just to rephrase that, that, that does not mean that humans created primates in the sense of a directed conscious choice. Whether evolution is true or not is beside the point. So just because, it, we, we would, you would not say, well, humans must have created monkeys. That's why monkeys have a similar, you know, you wouldn't say that. Just like you wouldn't have to say, well, aliens created humans if there was a common genetic link. Uh, you, wouldn't have, you wouldn't have to say that. So whether evolution is true or not, it's beside the point. A Christian explanation for uh, genetic relationship is that all life was created by God's design. So of course there would be relationships. From a Christian perspective, God prefers to create bi biological life and other things in certain ways, so we should expect those ways to be repeated throughout the rest of his creation. So using extraterrestrial life of any kind as proof of a cause and effect relationship, logically unsound. It's an incoherent relationship. Again, we are genetically related in certain ways to primates. We are even far more technologically advanced than primates. Uh, just like aliens would be to us. However, that does not mean that we created primates. Therefore, despite what one believes about evolution, proof of extraterrestrial life would not cancel out any biblical understanding of creation, even if the ET life happened to have a genetic similarity to human beings. If anything, I think that would lend further support to a common creator of humans and extraterrestrials. A creator would have a vested interest in creating things the same kind of way, whereas in the evolutionary, naturalistic, materialistic view, nature tries different things at different times, and so, you know, it, 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 it doesn't seem to fit. Now, would there be a threat to the inerrancy of Scripture? Would Jesus actually have to die and resurrect on every alien planet? We are going to talk about all of that and more in the members only section. So make sure to go to dailyrenegade.com and get a membership today for the rest of this episode and so much more. Also, again, if you enjoy this topic, we have a documentary film available right now based on me and Derek Gilbert's book, The Day the Earth Stands Still. Uh, and it's a timely movie. It is all about the Israel UFO connection and what it means in a Biden presidency. It is called What Comes Next, and it is only available to paying members. So uh, if you have a trial, you, you can't get the movie. You can still get the rest of this episode with a free trial. Uh, so we do have those free trials available. But the film is only available for uh, monthly or yearly members. So go to dailyrenegade.com right now to see the film plus the rest of this episode and so much more. we got a lot more to talk about. Members, hang on the line. Everybody else, thank you so much for joining us. Until next time, take care and God bless.